Next up, we have Chuck Wyatt, who's going to cover Little Leaguer's shoulder, so we're going to move up a little bit to the shoulder. Great. Again, uh, we're really uh, we're uh, really glad to have uh, have your participation and, and uh, looking forward to a great lecture series in uh, 2020. So I'm going to talk about uh, again. My name is Chuck, is Chuck White. I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the leaguer's uh, uh, shoulder syndrome. I have uh, I have no disclosures. So what is it? So uh, the medical the, the medical term is proximal humeral uh, epiphysialysis or uh, little leaguer syndrome, uh, uh, shoulder syndrome. It's the other little leaguer syndrome. Most people have heard of little leaguer's elbow elbow syndrome, uh, and. Uh, and what it is, it's a painful overuse condition of the shoulder that causes widening of the growth plate at the proximal humeral growth plate. Um, it occurs primarily in the, uh, the dominant arm of uh, baseball uh, pitchers, but it can occur in any other, uh, in other overhead sports like such as softball, tennis, volleyball, and swimming. And what are the causes? What are the causes and, and, and uh, risk factors? So the, the pathophysiology uh, is the repetitive shear forces that are imposed on the uh, unossified cartilage of the proximal humerus physis. And so, um, when you know, when we think about you know the you know the pitch uh, sequence and the mechanics uh, of the pitch sequence, there's a tremendous amount of force that's placed across the shoulder. Um, as, as we rear back and the arm goes into a tremendous amount of external rotation and the arm is accelerating backwards and then as we, as we go to slow down and as we're coming through, there's a massive amount of rotational forces that are imposed on, on that growth plate. And anytime we're talking about uh, uh, literally your sh uh, shoulder syndrome, I, I think it's important to look at what, uh, what normal uh, shoulder an anatomy is uh, in, a, in a pediatric patient. And so where my arrow is there, that's, that's what a normal physis looks like of, of the uh, proximal humerus. So our, our, uh, our case is, uh, so this is a 12-year-old male who plays both pitcher and catcher. Uh, he plays for two teams. He plays year-round. He's had pain with throwing for, for four months. And, you know, the reason that he actually presented was, well, you know, I just had a little, you know, I had pain with, with throwing, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm sort of used to that and all, but now, now I have pain when I'm, when I'm not throwing. Uh, he's having pain with ADLs. He has pain just to, you know, just to lift his arm um, in general. And so, you know, and then when we look at, uh, when we look at his x-rays here, we can see, you, you can see there, there's even a little bit of uh, fragmentation that's at the anterolateral aspect of, of, of the growth plate here. You see widening of the growth plate and almost a ground glass appearance. Uh, when we look at the you know, standard uh, AP of the shoulder and then when we look at a cross table lateral of the shoulder, we also see uh, you know, a tremendous amount of widening of, of, the, uh, of the growth plate there. And you can actually see that there's actually even a little bit of rotation that's actually occurred with this kid because this kid is on the severe end. Uh, he's on the severe uh, end of the uh, of, of the bell curve, and uh, you know the the you know the thought of the primary reason why this occurs is the rotator cuff muscles attach on the epiphyseal side, so above the growth plate, and then all the other major muscles of the, of the arm are uh, attached below it. And so there's a you know, again that's where we get our our big shear forces, big rotational forces that are happening, and this is occurring over and over and over and over again, and. You know, which causes uh, which causes this uh, causes this condition. Risk factor is is being a pitcher or or being a catcher. So you know about you know, 80 or 93 94 percent of all of all uh, athletes who have uh, little leaguer shoulder syndrome are either a pitcher or a catcher. It can be uh, you can see it in other positional players in baseball. Um, you know it and. Uh, it typically occurs between the age of uh, 12 and 13. That's your highest incidence. You know, f you know probably 50% of all f of all athletes that get this condition are either 12 or 13 years old. Although we do see it in kids as young as eight and as old as 15. As long as your growth plate, as long as that growth plate remains open, you can get this condition. The other things to think is to consider. Uh, if you take care of lots of athletes, is that it is not only males. You can't, you know, females can get this condition. Uh, other athletes besides, um, as we talked about, other, other athletes besides baseball players can also get this condition. We do see it in softball some. My own daughter actually had, had a bit of this uh, condition that we had to deal with for a little bit where uh, we were hitting, uh, you know, we were using uh, weighted balls 
practicing hitting and she, and while returning the ball to me, she picked it up and she threw it to me. And you know, which which is a really really bad idea. And so she didn't have a pop or anything like that, but she didn't you know very shortly thereafter develop pain around that growth plate with you know with throwing. We also see it in tennis players. I have I have uh, had several uh, tennis players and and. Um, in my practice who present. Typically, it's after they've uh, uh, spent a lot of time working with a, with a new coach, they're working on their serve, and they just hit you know, just millions and millions and millions of serves, working on a, a new technique or, or whatnot over a period of time. And so if you think about, you know, tennis players get way up high like this, massively externally rotated, lots of torque coming down, again, causing that, uh, causing that shear force. And uh, so it can also not be in your in the dominant arm if you have a if you have a swimmer. Uh, sometimes swimmers will, can present with this uh, condition as well, uh, and it may be in the uh, non-dominant arm again, uh, just because of the uh, shear forces that are placed across the growth plate. How do you diagnose it? So Lilliger's shoulder syndrome it's primarily a clinical diagnosis. Uh, history your history is extremely important. Uh, they'll have diffuse pain with throwing in the beginning, and then they may have uh, pain with uh, ADLs in advanced stages, just being a pain putting on their shirts, just uh, uh, trying to lift the arm overhead. Um, again, it's a clinical diagnosis. You, do, you don't have to uh, necessarily have x-rays, particularly in the early onset of the condition where uh, they uh, you know, have a recent onset of shoulder pain, uh, and they get to you pretty quickly. You don't necessarily have to have x-rays to do it. Uh, your physical exam, they'll have focal tenderness at the physis, and it's typically on the anterolateral aspect of the physis. The best physical, in my opinion, the best physical exam for this is, is pain with resisted internal rotation. And so I'll often, you know, I'll often bl block the back of their shoulder uh, with one hand and, and then have them try to internally rotate with me, and that'll reproduce their pain. I think that's the best uh, exam. Oftentimes, these kids will have uh, glenohumeral internal rotation deficiency, um, uh, where they've, you know, because the back of the shoulder gets tight with, with throwing, and then they'll have limited internal rotation. That's highly associated with Lilliger's uh, shoulder syndrome. Um, when, you, when you do get x rays, um, uh, which oftentimes, oftentimes you will, again, you don't absolutely have to. Um, if, the, uh, if your diagnosis is in question, sometimes contralateral films are useful, uh, and usually just a single view, of the, uh, a single uh, shoulder ex external rotation view is useful. And MRI is rarely, uh, rarely, rarely ever indicated. Treatment and prevention, so, so treatment is forced rest for uh, six to 12 weeks, usually more along the lines of 12 weeks. Physical therapy, we, physical therapy for you know, sleeper stretches because they often, again they oftentimes have glenohumeral internal rotation deficiency. We do periscapular stabilization and strengthening of the ro rotator cuff muscles, uh, and then uh, an interval throwing program uh, begins when they're pain free. So if a kid comes in that's super symptomatic, I won't even start it. I won't even start an interval throwing program until they're at least six weeks in. Let them like completely calm down. Prevention is training with educated coaches, learn proper form, working on uh, trunk rotation se uh, sequence, it, you know, strict adherence to pitch counts. P you know, pitch counts do matter. Uh, they need to avoid uh, pitching with fatigue. Uh, there's pitching guidelines for, for you guys that uh, I've attached for you. When can they return to play? So they can return to play when they've uh, when they're completely pain free and they've they've completed an interval throwing program, um, and then you know as we're returning them to play, we really stress the importance of keeping up with sleeper stretches for for maintenance. It's it's you know they the kids who are throwing need to do sleeper stretches and maintain the, their internal rotation uh, as long as they're playing. Uh, so non baseball athletes like volleyball players and tennis players, you know if they you know. Fine to send them back at six weeks if, if they're uh, if they're pain if they're pain free, and uh, key recommendations for practice. So the incidence of, of the Lilliger syndrome is rising probably eight percent a year uh, out of out of uh, one study. You know year over year eight percent. So it, it is it is uh, increasing, uh, and uh, encourage diversification. You know have uh, encourage your patients to participate in, in uh, other sports, uh, in, so we can develop well-rounded athletes. Thank you. Question. Any questions for Chuck? Chuck, I have a question for you. So when you have, uh, the, particularly in this area, uh, these families that have put ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 into their, their sport and they've, they've paid for this season, they've invested a lot of time, 
uh, they're not always willing to, to say, I'm just going to sit out. You know, that's not really what they want to hear. And so when you have that family, how do you feel about suggesting playing a different position or moving to a, a different position, maybe? Yeah, I think it's a, you know, I think that's a, uh, that, that, that's a great question because uh, that, that does come up from, from time to time. Um, if they're not having pain with, with activities of daily living, uh, you can consider allowing them to play first base. You know, there's just, there are many, the, the, the distance of your throne is much shorter. Your, your, uh, the, the, uh, you know, the quantity uh, uh, pitches that you, or uh, throws that you have are much much lower, so that's that's okay. Uh, oftentimes, we we'll recommend that they work on their they work on hitting, work on their bunning. I don't let them hit if they're uh, you know if, if they're really really symptomatic. I don't let them hit, um, but uh, if, when they're pain free, let them start hitting. Tell them to work on their bunning, that sort of thing. You just try to be creative about uh, things that they can do to be proactive. 